able to share with you this morning. Um, I don't have a big, a lot of big circumstances in my life. My life has been one of kind of quiet and for the most part um, smaller things, but that's one of the things that has become real and very powerful to me, that God is in the details of my life. And just a touch of that this morning, the song we sang was Don's mom's favorite hymn. So that to me today. Pray with me, please. As the psalmist says, Father, I love you. You are the source of my salvation, my strength, my security, <clears throat> my shield, and my stronghold. May the words that I share this morning glorify you and be useful in your kingdom. Amen. Now, those of you that know me know that I can wander, too, so I'm going to really try to stick <laughs> with what I feel the Lord has said. Um, called me to share with you, but I have lots of stories, so particularly my key story is my favorite one right now, so ask me later if you want to hear some more of the details. I'm blessed that I was born into a Christian family. I had wonderful Christian parents. My grandparents on both sides were Christians. My family dedicated me to the Lord as an infant. There was not a time in my years of living at home when my family was not closely affiliated with the church attending Sunday school, worship, and deeply involved in church activities and community ministry. My parents just didn't tell us to do that. They modeled it. They were examples of Micah 6, 8, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Their strongest friendships came from our church family. When I was 12, I began asking deeper spiritual questions, and in the Methodist tradition, which is where I was being raised, I was deemed ready to take on the responsibility for my own spiritual growth and development and to make a personal commitment to Christ, to take over that responsibility that my parents had, had committed themselves to as an infant in, in my infancy. I attended six weeks of classes with my pastor and my peers, and I learned a lot about my personal relationship with Christ as my Savior and Redeemer, a little bit of church history, some of the responsibilities of Christian growth and church membership. And after completing those classes, I decided I wanted to formally join the church fellowship and make a public profession of faith. I was confirmed as a member of the church on Palm Sunday in 1959. The lessons I learned in those classes are still with me today and come back from, from, with frequency. My dad was a research chemist, and that brought multiple job changes for him, it resulted in a lot of relocations of where home was for my family. As I got older, I really resented what I saw as the upheaval, and I resisted my parents' example of flexibility and excitement for new opportunities. I was often very short-tempered and quite vocal about my feelings. The last move I made with my family was immediately before the start of my senior year in high school, and I exploded. My parents expected me to leave my friends, my school, my activities in Boston and move of all places to Paducah, Kentucky, which was 250 miles from anything. I was not happy. I begged them to let me stay with my friends. I had it all worked out, but they insisted in gentle and loving but firm terms that being with our family was more important. They were gracious. They sent me to stay with my grandmother for a couple of weeks during the actual move, but I had to go. I resolved, and I told them this on multiple occasions in not very many nice ways, that I would not be happy and that I would make things miserable for everyone in the family. And I was pretty successful at that for most of that year. <laughs> My parents didn't lash back. They listened. They gave me space. They responded with love and grace and boundaries to my rebellious attitude and comments. They encouraged me to go back to Boston to college, which I did. In retrospect, that was a big sacrifice for them, emotionally, financially, and spiritually. But they put their trust in God that he would take care of me, and they made the sacrifice. Well, I got what I wanted. My freshman year of college, I wasn't happy. I liked being there, but it wasn't what I expected it would be. I was always looking ahead or looking behind. I wasn't living in the present. I attended worship on a fairly regular basis and did some Bible study, but I wasn't involved. I wasn't really connected. 
God showed me that living, I was living by my plan and not by his. Although I was a Christian, he certainly was not the center of my life. When I asked to transfer to a school closer to my family for the next year, my parents welcomed me with grace, open hearts and arms, not, well, I told you so. Their acceptance mirrored God's forgiveness and the actions of the father of the prodigal son. The mental image of him running with joyous abandon to greet his returning son is very powerful to me. It reminds me that God does that very same thing for us any time we've turned away and we make the first move back to him. After graduation from college and during the beginning years of my professional life, I wasn't really involved in the church fellowship. I taught school, I built relationships, I left teaching, I moved to Nashville, became a banker. I wasn't miserable, but I wasn't content, and I certainly wasn't joyful. I didn't give my relationship with Christ the priority that it should have. I neglected the support, the encouragement, the growth, and accountability that comes from active connection with a body of believers. I wasn't so much angry all the time, and I wasn't as bad of a yeller as I used to be but I still didn't fully grasp the my plan versus God's plan concept. Boom. The bottom fell out of my Nashville life, and I faced personal challenges and obstacles that I realized I couldn't overcome on my own power. A constant since the Paducah experience was my friend Don, who I met through a high school classmate. We remained friends through my college, my work, his work, his Army experience, his college, my move from Paducah to Nashville, his move from Paducah to Atlanta. And so I called him in despair, and I, he said, come to Atlanta for a few days to talk and get some perspective. And by the way, bring something to wear to church on Sunday. God used my faithful Christian friend. His grace and fellowship and influence changed my life from just believing to living in my belief. Jesus became my Lord as well as my Savior. I claimed Romans 8.28 as a verse that I could apply to my life. In the circumstances of that time, I chose to relinquish control and to commit myself to God. He asked, I asked him to lead and direct me. I listened, and I looked for his plan rather than doing it by myself. I began the habit of daily prayer and Bible study. I'm thankful to this day for my Don's influence in my life and in my decision to walk closely with the Lord. He modeled consistency, support, faithful dependence on God. He was and is a true friend. Bonus in the process, after eight years of friendship, which was the longest friendship I'd ever had with any one person because of all of our moves, the relationship changed. Some pieces fell in place. I moved to Atlanta and we got married in five months. <laughs> but we knew each other well after all those years of true friendship. We knew a lot about each other. And we still loved each other. <laughs> so everything was well. We were in Atlanta. We were bankers. And while we had a son, we bought a house. <sighs> we were settled. God was doing it just my way. Boom. <laughs> God called Don into ministry. And I was part of the package. What? quit his secure job, sell our house, move, go to seminary. But this time, through God's grace, it was different. I was different. I was able to share Don's excitement and trust God in the process. Off we went to Louisville, confident that God would call us back to Atlanta after Don finished seminary. Now, again, there's lots of stories and all this, but we don't have time for that. Oops, my plan again. We were coming back to Atlanta. Well, but this time we paid attention seeking his will and committed to going wherever he led, which was clearly Jacksonville, and ultimately to the beach. Following God's plan has brought blessings greater than I could ever have envisioned. Have there been small and large challenges? Oh my goodness, yes. But God has taught me that if I let it, out of challenge comes growth. Would I have chosen the challenges, especially the large ones? No. But when I look at the results, I am so thankful. We recently worshiped with my Texas cousins, which was a, another long story and a huge blessing. And their pastor asked us to articulate our spiritual pillars, a perfect question as I was preparing for today. God is in the details. His hand is in the routines of my life. 
So my first pillar is my personal relationship with Jesus Christ that came to be and continues to develop through significant earthly relationships, parents, grandparents, Don, our children, our grandchildren, our Christian friends. As these important people know and love me, God does so even more. He knows me intimately, the psalmist tells me. My name is engraved on his hand, says Isaiah. He bends down and he listens to me, the psalmist reminds me. And he intercedes when I don't know what or how to pray, Paul tells me in Romans. The second pillar is that God is interested, and if I permit him to be, he's involved in the details of my life. My attentiveness and faithfulness to him in the small things prepares me for the major things. While teaching me to do needlework, my grandmother always insisted that my finished items should be beautiful and orderly on both sides, not just the front. I've come to take her words as an illustration of God's interest in the what is seen and unseen in my life, his expectation that they be consistent, and his willingness to help me do that if I'll let him in. Third, I choose to reflect Christ in my life and strive to do so consistently through my words and actions. The scripture tells me what that looks and sounds like. I should be an optimist, dwelling on the things in people and circumstances that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, the best, not the worst, Philippians tells us. I am to pursue godliness, not just wait for it. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, we find in 1 Timothy. And my gentleness is to be known to all, says Philippians, not just the ones that are easy to be gentle towards. And I'm to pass my comfort to others so that through me spreads the fragrance of knowing Christ, we find in, first, in 2 Corinthians. The Holy Spirit will help me do that if I ask and yield to him. From that recommitment on my visit to Atlanta until now, I have tried to be faithful in my Christian walk. I'm blessed to have been married to my best friend for 44 years. There have been minor and major challenges and changes in our lives, and I've come to understand and celebrate that today's circumstances are not permanent, but a preparation for the next step, whatever that might be. My physical surroundings, my responsibilities, and even the people in my life will change. God is the only constant. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Regardless of the changes and the challenges that come in our lives, we can trust God's unfailing love, his presence, his guidance, and his provision. With God's help, we're learning new roles, and I, this we is us, but all of us too, and acknowledging new responsibilities as our family and circumstances change. We have walked together and individually with our Lord. He's guided us in our decisions. He's held us in the palm of his hand through our years together and even before that and will into the future. It is exciting and comforting to experience God in our lives through the seasons and the circumstances. And I'll be glad to share any minor and major stories anytime you have a while. <laughs> Let's pray together. Dear God of the ages, our past, our present, and our future,